for the opportunity to be able to worship like that, folks. I'll tell you, I, I love going out to eat. That's my hobby, if you didn't know that. Amen? But i got to tell you, something I love even more than that is to be in the presence with God's people, with his power in this place like this today. I'm telling you, it doesn't get any better than that. Amen? Take your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. We're continuing in our series of messages uh, with the theme of the blessings of the blood. And then last week, kind of under the theme of the blessings of the blood, we started talking about some of the, uh, the exciting news that, and blessings that we get. We talked about spiritual blessings. And we said that one of the greatest spiritual blessings, if not maybe, perhaps you might even argue today, the greatest blessing at all, spiritual or even physical, whatever it is, is the gift of salvation. Can we all agree with that today? <clears throat> to know that there's been atonement and forgiveness of sin and redemption and some of those theological terms that we're kind of getting used to. And I want you to start wrapping your mind around them because they're just so powerful. And uh, we're talking about salvation as a choice. And, and uh, so today we're going to do kind of part two of that message of salvation as a choice. Some would say, is it really our choice whether we're saved or not? Well, I believe it is. And I believe the Bible makes the case for exactly that. Second Peter chapter 3, if you found those verses, starting at verse 8, say amen. Are you with me today? Look at these words. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. One of these times I'm going to let Orman explain to you what all that means. <laughs> all right? It's a little over my head there. No, it's very obvious that the Lord is in charge and that the Lord is in charge of time. Y'all believe that? Say amen this morning. Man, I tell you, isn't it amazing that, think about this, Jesus has never been in a hurry. God's never in a hurry. Yet he's never late. Jesus is never late. You remember when Lazarus, he had to bring him up. Everybody says, oh, you're too late. You showed up late for the party. No, he was just getting ready for the big finale. Amen? He wanted them to think he was too late, and then he rose him right up from the dead. And uh, God's promises are true. Look in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise. Now, there's a lot of promises in the Bible. He's never going to break one of them. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word. Now, look at this, verse 9. You ought to put a star by this verse. Not willing that any should perish. <clears throat> is salvation a choice? It is. <clears throat> is it a possibility for all men to be saved? I believe that it is. Here it is. God is not willing that any should perish. There are some very hyper-Calvinists that will try to tell you that God's already decided who's going to be saved, and not everyone can be saved. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's in violation of the Scriptures. I mean, if that's true, Peter sure was confused here, Orman, because he's saying here, in different translations translated different, he is not willing that any should perish. That word perish is the same word used in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him shall not what? Let's say it together. Perish. There's that word perish. That means to be put into hell. It means to be literally destroyed into hell someday. And he says, but look you there. He's not willing that any should perish, but that what? Some? Doesn't say few, does it? That all should come to what? Repentance. And when this word is used here in this particular place in the passage of Scripture, repentance is talking about redemption. You have to repent to be saved. Y'all believe that? Say amen. You know, there was a lot of teaching out there a few years ago that says believing plus nothing. A famous pastor in Arkansas one time, and I mean multi, I had millions of people listening to him, he wrote a book called Believing Plus Nothing where he argued that all you had to do is have intellectual belief to be saved, that you didn't have to repent to be saved. Well, I want to tell you, that's just not true. That's, you'll never be saved unless you turn. Repentance means turn away from your sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. You turn your back on the world and the sin. And somebody got saved, if you really got saved, you turned your back on the world and sin, and you turned toward the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what biblical repentance is. Verse 10 says, but the day of the Lord will come. Look at this. He's saying there's coming a time when everybody better be saved. But the day of the Lord will come as a what? Thief in the night, in that which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works 
that are therein shall be burned up. May God bless the preaching of his word. You may be seated. As you're being seated this morning, I want to use these scriptures as the foundation in part two of this message that salvation is a choice. As a matter of review, as we go back when we talk about redemption, atonement, salvation, I said three things last Sunday, and I had to say them fast, so I want to review them just real fast here. I want you to see that, first of all, there is only one way that a person can be saved. Amen? Salvation, that we're reviewing last week, one way to salvation. There's not two ways. There's not three ways. And by the way, we're going to camp here a little bit more in a little bit, but it's by grace that we're saved. Amen? Do you know that most denominations, now listen to this, most denominations teach that you have to work your way to heaven. Now, they may say, well, grace is involved, but also works is involved. Here's something that's very important to grow and to, and, and to get the victory that God wants you to have is to understand grace. Now, when I talk about grace, Pastor Pat, I'm not talking about a cheap form of grace. You know, in fact, grace doesn't mean anything if you get grace all the time in your life. Amen? When my kids would get in trouble, they would always play the grace card. Why don't we use grace this time? And there were times that we used grace. But let me ask you this. If we gave grace all the time, then they would say, well, there's no consequences to it. Grace wouldn't mean anything. And, man, when they got grace, they were like, wow, man, I, I I'm really didn't get in trouble this time. Even though I deserve trouble, I didn't get in trouble this time. And grace was a big deal. Well, let me tell you something. When it comes to God's grace working in our lives today, I want to tell you something. It's really a big deal. Amen, church? It is a big deal. Because none of us, I want you to get this, none of us, absolutely none of us, deserve salvation. I said that the greatest gift of all, the greatest of the spiritual blessings, and there are many of them, the greatest of the spiritual blessings is salvation itself. I mean, think about it. Say that God blessed us on this earth. Let's say that every time we prayed, boy, God just answered everything we wanted. That'd be kind of nice, wouldn't it? I mean, wouldn't you like to be able just to pray and anything, I mean, when I was growing up, my mom wouldn't let us watch the show Bewitched, you know. But when she wasn't in there, I'd turn on and watch it because I liked it. And uh, I really think I just thought Samantha was pretty. I think it was more than that. And, uh, but what I, I loved about it, she could just rick on her nose and boom, something would happen. You need a new car? No problem, man. She'd snap her fingers and be a new car. And, um, you know, I thought, man, just think if you ever, what if we had the ability to have spiritual blessings like that? Anything we wanted, we could do. But at the end of this life, we still had to die and go to hell. Still had to die and go to hell. That wouldn't mean too much to me. I mean, it'd be kind of fun while it lasted, you know. In fact, isn't that kind of the philosophy today? People say, man, I'm going to hell anyway, so I might as well just really enjoy it. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Isn't that sad to even think that? Isn't that sad to think that? I, I heard this story, and I think it's a true story. Uh, about a guy, a, a, actually it was a lady that was flying on an airplane, and she was flying overseas, an, over, an overseas flight. Some of our folks just got back from Hawaii, and that was long enough, wasn't it, to get to Hawaii back. Shannon said, boy, it's worth it when you get there, but it's a trip over there, and it's true. And this true story, she was flying overseas, and so after they got airbound and was flying through the air, the stewardess came along and says, well, we're going we're gonna to give you a menu here, and you can pick out something to eat. Well, everybody chose what they wanted and marked it on the menu. She went and started bringing the food. But this one lady, she said, no, thank you. I'm not interested. She said, you don't want anything to eat? No, no, man. I, she said, no, no, sir. I, I'm not interested. I don't want anything to eat. Well, they went past her. Pretty soon they came again. They finished the meal, and they brought their snack around. I, I tell you, on, used to, it's not true anymore. Used to, you could gain five pounds on a long flight. Amen. <laughs> That was the good old days. Those had to fly. Amen? Tony's saying amen to that. He's on some of those flights. Nowadays, if you're lucky, they throw a package of pretzels at you. Well, we've gone from peanuts. Someone might be allergic to peanuts, so we can't have peanuts anymore. We eat those nasty pretzels. I know they're good for you, but, boy, I mean, if I just had some ranch dressing to dip them in or something, you know, in an emergency situation, I just pour salt all over them. Amen? I figure a way to eat those things. <clears throat> this went on clear to the flight. As they got ready to land, somebody asked her, well, why didn't you, I noticed you didn't eat or drink. She said, because I didn't bring any money with me. She said, I, I didn't want to pay for it. And they said, M pay for it, lady? You already paid for it. She said, are you kidding me? Anybody else had that kind of surprise? 
She said, you mean all that was including the ticket? She said, no one ever told me that. First time she'd ever flown. I'm going to tell you, if I'd her, I'd went back there and asked for a doggy bag, amen, or something, all right? I, I wouldn't have handled that so well. And when I read that, I thought how tragic because she didn't realize what she had. She didn't realize everything that came with the ticket she had. And, folks, I want to tell you, isn't that pretty true with us in some ways today? When, when we talk about grace and we talk about salvation and we talk about all that comes with salvation, I don't think we realize all there is to it. And, and so and the, one, the only one that can bring salvation to us is the Lord Jesus Christ. Many denominations teach that, well, there's works involved and all that. No, no, it is totally salvation. Is, there's only one way, and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to see number two. We're reviewing a little bit. <clears throat> Anyone and everyone can be saved. I want to hear a loud amen in that this morning. Don't listen to the Calvinist who would say before the foundation of the earth, God decided that some may, this person's going to hell and this person's going to heaven. That is not taught in the Bible. And you say, well, what about predestination? I'm glad you asked about that. Did you know nowhere in the Bible, <clears throat> nowhere in the Bible, do we find where anyone has been predestined to go to hell? Nowhere. I dare you find it. You can't find it, can you, Brother Pat, Brother Orman? It's not in there. And when you see the predestination when it's used in the Bible, it's always in the context of eternal life or heaven. And when you say, well, what are we predestined to be? Before the foundation of the earth, were we predestined? Yes, but let me tell you what that means. We were predestined to become like Jesus and to be all that God wanted us to be. Say, I don't know if that's right or not. It is. You might as well go ahead and say amen to it. Amen? All right. <clears throat> Some of you will wake up in the middle of the night and say, boy, preacher, right again up there, you know. You know, we've spent a little time studying this, and, and we've spent a lot of time studying it. And when it talks about election, that God has elected us to be saved, and election predestination, and none of those ever teach us that God has decided that atonement is only for a limited amount of people. That is being preached. You say, man, I, I always kind of grew up in the Baptist church where it said, man, everybody be saved. And per apparently those evangelists of the past, man, they thought everybody could be saved. You say, how do you know? Because their invitations went an hour long. Amen? Phyllis Krause is here from Kansas. Her dad was one of those preachers. And I mean, I'm telling you, they preached and they gave an invitation and they pled for people to come down and be saved. Brother Bob, that used to pastor here in the town, his invitations were so long that they decided that somebody needed to go down so they could get out by 1 or 2 o'clock and go home. So they take turns of somebody going down. Brother Bob said, I'm not letting go of this. Somebody comes and gets saved. Because they knew that salvation was a choice. And they knew that God, was, that God had offered salvation and, and that Jesus had paid the price. And, and so don't listen to any of this baloney that is out there that teaches that works is involved in salvation. And, and then the other part of baloney, well, I even hate to say baloney because I happen to like baloney, amen? I'll just be honest with you. I mean, put enough mayonnaise and cheese on it, and it's good to go, amen? Tomato, fresh tomato grown in Arkansas, it is good to go. Then top it off with an onion, amen? What? You're having the same reaction that Barbara had all these years, amen? Barbara just kind of gets away from me when I start eating those baloney sandwiches and popping those onions. Say, preacher, is that in the notes? No, but it needs to be. Amen? All right. It's important. <laughs> Got to get some of this settled today. Salvation is a choice. And there's nowhere in the Bible that talks about limited atonement. And that's you're going to hear that phrase. You say, why are you telling us that today? Because someday you're going to have to choose churches. And you, you've got to decide and make sure say, well, uh, my pastor is just, you know, he's just into this Calvinism, the hyper-Calvinism. And I think that's such a tragedy. And in fact, I think it's a trick from Satan. I think it's an attack in these last days to slow down the greatest denomination, in my opinion, that's ever been put together. And, and certainly the most powerful mission force in the world. And let me tell you something. The devil has tried and is doing his best to kill evangelism and missions because that kind of teaching, that's exactly what it will do. Somebody said, well, then why would we send missionaries? Some, some Calvinists say, well, because God told us to, so we need to be obedient, so we'll go do it. Baloney, yes, we need to be obedient. But the reason we need to be obedient, you listen to me, is because there are boys and girls that are going to die and go to hell if someone doesn't go tell them. Because Brazil's not going to be saved unless the missionaries go. 
The Bible said, how shall they hear if nobody goes and tells them? And I'll tell you, the same is true right here in Corpus Christi. You see, you know, and I've seen people get excited about missions, and, and Bobby's putting together some medical mission trips, and we're going to do some other mission trips, and, and we're, going to, we're going to travel, and we're going to do some of these things. But I've got to tell you something. To me, we're, we'd be the biggest bunch of hypocrites if we say, well, we're going to go mission trips. <clears throat> we're, we're going to get on airplanes and go overseas, but we're not going to walk across the street to Dolphin Way and try to win anyone to Jesus. I, I've been in churches that do it and say, oh, yeah, well, we believe mission trips, man. We, we believe in... We want to go where they speak a different language and do it. And that's a part of being a Acts 1-8 church. An Acts 1-8 church is a church that takes the Great Commission right where you start to the next level and the next level until finally you get across the world. <clears throat> Summit Church Texas needs to be an Acts 1-8 church. That means that we, we're interested in evangelism and missions everywhere. But it starts in our own backyard. You see, nowhere in the Bible, and I know this may be elementary to some of you, but we've got a lot of brand new Christians. By the way, we've got over 30 people waiting to be baptized. Isn't that exciting? Some of you told me, one of our new Christians came to me the other day and says, I cannot wait for Sundays. I can't wait for Wednesdays. I wish we had church every single night in this place. I started to say, don't tempt me. Amen. We might do it. Don't worry. They'll hang around us long enough pretty soon. They'll say, Sundays and Wednesdays is enough. All right, it won't take them long. They'll get there, I promise you, all right? <clears throat> I've told you all, and I tease when I do this, but I always tell these new Christians, they say, well, what's it mean to tithe? I said, it means give 30%. He said, 30%? Why would you tell them something like that? Because pretty soon they'll get around you all and figure out that it's a lot less than that, amen? See, then, that, then when they realize, well, it's not, it's, not, it's 10%, man, all of a sudden you feel like you're getting a good deal at that point, Amen? I'm, I shouldn't be telling my strategy here like this, all right? Salvation, by the way, salvation's free, by the way, amen? Aren't you glad that money can't buy our salvation? If it costs very much, most of us are here to be in trouble, wouldn't we? <laughs> you know? What if God says, well, to be saved, all you got to do is walk around the block three times? You know, there's a lot of people who couldn't walk around the block three times. What if God said, well, $10,000 and you're in? Some people couldn't pay $10,000. Probably most people wouldn't. Salvation. First of all, there's only one way, and it's Jesus. Secondly, anyone can be saved. And then thirdly, there's only an open door and an amount of time for salvation. Second, Second Corinthians 6 says that today is the day of salvation. Say, so, preacher, what's that mean? That means that just like there came a time when everybody was invited to be on the ark. Boy, nobody wanted it. In fact, can you imagine all the laughing carrying on while the ark was being built? The same way they laughed at Jesus because Jesus, when he was a young boy and when Jesus started doing his ministry, they laughed at him too. And the Bible says that God closed the door of the ark at a certain time. Let me ask you something. After that door was closed and sealed, was it ever going to be opened again until after the flood? No. didn't matter if you went up and said, Hey, I changed my mind, God. It never rained like they'd seen before. I'm telling you, the, the weather forecasters really hadn't got it right since then. Amen. Somebody was watching TV saying, Well, it's not going to rain. It's never rained. Don't listen to the meteorologists. And I like Bell Nelson, but don't listen to him. Amen. He's a good guy, but, boy, he misses it. it. You know, I know you know when we're going to get a flood, when they say there's a 20% chance of rain in Corpus Christi, I go, oh, no. When they say there's a 100% chance, I just I get, I keep on mowing and doing whatever we're going to do. You're safe, all right? God closed the door of the ark. And, and it was too late. And, and I believe, and this, this is not in the Bible, but I believe that, when people saw the water rising and started screaming, I think they were screaming, let us in, let us in, let us in. By the way, it wasn't Noah's decision because, first of all, it wasn't Noah's ark. It was God's ark. Amen? Salvation comes down to God. You say, well, why is salvation the way it is? Because that's the way God wanted it. God, God made us. God made salvation. God put the plan of salvation together. You say, when did God decide the plan of salvation? That's a pretty good question. We don't know, but it was before the earth was even put together. The great thing about God is he's not having to do crisis management today. Amen? 
Boy, I am. I'm always in some kind of crisis. And, and I'll tell you, being a pastor, everybody thinks your crisis is my emergency. Amen? I'm going to put a sign up one of these days that says, your crisis is not my emergency. You say, well, that's kind of rude. Why not? Because I'm having my own crisis. Okay? I heard about these two people were in a prayer meeting. True story. And they were preachers. And they were on their knees and they were praying. And God, I mean, it was intense. And all these preachers were praying. And this other preacher got excited. He leaned over to the other one. And he said, man, he said, he said, pray for me. And the other preacher leaned over and he says, I can't, man. I can't afford to. I'm too busy praying for myself. You know, at least he's being honest. And when the door of the ark was closed, it was too late. And I don't know if they could hear the, the screaming and the hollering, the anguish. But I'm here to tell you, I'll bet there was. They weren't worried about life preservers. Didn't have life jackets. Ah, oh, that's foolishness. How silly. Water falling from the sky and covering the trees and the mountains. How foolish. How foolish today when people look at the church. How foolish. Get up in the morning, go to Summit Church, Texas. Why, you could get up and go fishing today. One of the best fishermen I've ever known in my life is Don, and he's sitting right here. God blessed him. He was a guide for many, many years here. And one of the best. But you know what Don did? Don went, Don went to church on Sundays. I'm sure he thought, boy, I can make 500 bucks tomorrow. I can go to church next Sunday. If that's your attitude, what happens next Sunday? Well, $500 is pretty good this Sunday, man. I'll... I'll I'll go next Sunday, next Sunday, next Sunday, next Sunday. Sometimes church work and doing ministry, and let's just be honest, stepping out in faith seems foolish, even sometimes to us. I mean, let me ask you this. You ever, has God ever called you to do something that didn't seem very necessary to you or too exciting about it? Maybe you haven't had this experience. I have a few times. Or maybe you say, well, God, I'm willing to do it. But, man, it just doesn't make any sense. But isn't it amazing that when we take one step forward for the Lord, then the next steps get easier? And then all of a sudden, and if you, if you live to be old enough, like some of us that are getting older, you know one of the advantages of getting older? The older I get, the more I understand that God had a plan all along. Now, do I understand everything about God's plan in my life? No. Do I understand why God heals some people and he doesn't? Some people know. Do I understand why God takes some people to heaven sooner than others? I don't. Do I know why God just seems to anoint and bless some ministries and others struggle? I don't know all that, but I'll tell you what I do know. I know that God is a sovereign God, and I know that our God is in control today, church. And I've lived long enough, and the longer that I live. By the way, I've been preaching 39 years, and I'm not preaching anything different than when I started. My beliefs, I don't think they've changed at all. I've understood them a little more, and maybe I've developed them a little more, but I haven't had to change a lot in my theology. You say, well, what's the difference today? Today I understand it a little bit more than I did then. When I first started preaching, I preached through the whole Bible in 30 minutes. I could start in Genesis and finish up in Revelation. Now I can't even get through the introduction. Sharon will say amen to that up there. <clears throat> I guess you get older, you get long-winded too maybe or something. They thought it was foolish. God would build an ark. We're not going to be here long today because I'm, I want to zero in on this one concept, and when you get it, we'll be through. Salvation. Salvation is a choice. If you're taking notes, I'm going to give you four C's over the next couple of weeks. I'm going to give you one of them this morning. Salvation requires four things. True salvation, I'm talking about biblical salvation, requires four things. Number one, choice. Those people had a choice ready to get on the ark or not. Amen? They had a choice. 
God never makes anyone get saved. I have a first cousin in Arkansas who's watching us today and listening to this message. He watched it last week. And he said, Terry, he said, we grew up together. He said, I, I paid attention to every word you had to say about salvation. He said, when you come to Greenwood, we need to sit down and nail this thing down. Well, let me tell you something. Thomas, you need to nail it down. But I want to say to all the Thomases that are watching out there on Facebook today, and by the way, we had a couple thousand people that watched those messages last week. Today, there were people from all over the world watching Orman as he was teaching in his Sunday school class because of the media ministry here. I tell you, our media ministry is so powerful because it, it, it takes the message that's in here and it puts it clear across out in the world, folks. And part of our vision here at Summit Church Texas is to even do a better job of getting the message out of this building than we are now. They had a choice. Had a choice. Salvation is for everyone. People have asked me through the years, sincerely, what about those people that lived in the dark ages? What about the people before there was Facebook? You know, today, you, you know, to live in the era we live in and die and go to hell is even more stupid than in the past. I mean, you, I guess let me say it like this. It's harder to reject it today than it used to be because there's more opportunity to hear it. Can we all agree with that? I said, why is that? Let me tell you, I'm glad you asked. It's because God knows that there's a time is going to end. The Bible talks about times, dispositions of times in the Bible. And what that simply means is this. God operates in a certain way from point A to point B. And from point A to point B, God puts a time limit on it. There's different ages in the Bible. For instance, when you go to seminary Bible college, you'll teach, they'll teach you about that. They'll break the Old Testament up into certain segments and ages and time. And what that means, and what that means is that God just worked different in those, those, those times. God had a time that he started something, a time he ended something. Dispensationalism is what it's called. Dispensationalism. In this dispensation, God did this and he did that. Did you know that the church age is one of those times? Say amen. Church age? I thought the church age lasted forever because church feels like it lasts forever. I thought that too sometimes, especially when I was you. What do you mean by that? There's the Bible talks about and teaches a, a age of the church. I think it started at Pentecost, personally. I think the New Testament was born then. Some take it back further than that to the disciples with Jesus when the New Testament church started but I personally believe that the New Testament church was born at Pentecost because then all believers were indwelled by the Holy Spirit guys I got to tell you that ought to get us more excited today than anything in the world when we get saved not only does God accept us and we get to go to heaven we die but he comes into us that makes us different than all the other religions of the world you say, preacher, you mean, you mean Jesus really lives in me? If you're really saved, he really lives in you today. When we go out and help people in our paranormal ministry, in our spiritual warfare ministry, people want us to come in and, and, and take authority over those things. And, and you know what we do most of the time? And we do try to help, and we pray against things. There's, there's power in multiple prayers. There, there's power when groups of people pray. But the truth is, you have as much authority through the Lord as I have or Orman has to come and pray. Say, so, preacher, I just don't believe that. I, I just think, you know, you mean I, I can move God's heart like Orman Gwynn? Not necessarily. Because Orman's dedicated his life and, and he's been closer to the Lord. You say, does that make any difference? Well, let me ask him. Next time you need prayer, you going to call Orman or are you going to run down here to uh, Bottoms Up and go in the bar and say, hey, I need someone to pray for me. Anybody want to do that? No, thank you. No thing. First of all, I'm not going to bottoms up, amen? Unless I'm going in and take somebody to jail, and I've done that a few times. I don't care to go in there. But I'm not going to go in the bar and say, hey, I need somebody to pray for me. It's possible there's some Christians in those places. If they are, if they're really saved, I can tell you this, they're not enjoying it, amen? Say amen. Don't get that spiritual with me. I know too many of y'all, all right? 
I know too much, as the old prophet would say. There's a lot of backslidden Christians in a lot of places today. And I pray for them to come back to the Lord. But I'm not going to go to them and say, I know you're out here living like the devil. But boy, I, I just, God just puts you on my heart to come and ask you to pray for me. Or are you going to come up to the church and say, I want, I want Orman to pray for me or Brother Pat to pray? The Bible says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. What it really says in Greek is much more. Prayers of a righteous man availeth much more when they pray. So let me tell you, anybody can pray, but not everybody has the same authority in prayer. Amen? I read this week in the scriptures, and this commentator was commenting on it. He said that God can move mountains. Y'all believe that? Say amen. Can, can we move any mountains? Nah. Can you go over to Colorado Springs and say, I'm going to demand that mountain be moved? No. And it's not talking about just that kind of mountains anyway. But, but God can. God made the mountains. I'm, I'm sure he could plow them down if he wanted to. We can't move mountains. But listen to this. But we can pray. And when we pray, God moves, and then God can move the mountains. That's the difference. And that's the power that there is in being close to the Lord. Our, the closer we are to him, the more, the more our, prior, our prayers move the heart of God. And that's a powerful thing. That's, that's a good reason to clean up our lives, to turn off the computer in some areas, turn that TV off some areas. It's a good reason for you to be watching as parents, watching what your kids are, are using on that uh, telephone for. That's dangerous. Someone shared with me the other day, their nine-year-old granddaughter has a telephone and has Siri hooked up to it. Well, what's that? What's the big deal about that? A nine-year-old can ask Siri anything and bring it right down to that phone. Nine years old. We are got a paranormal call this week, and I'm working with a family in Kansas. And we were talking about their 16-year-old girl, and she's in a mess. And so I started asking questions, and the mom says, nope, 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 none of that's going on. I said, I don't believe it. She said, Pastor Terry. How can you indict my daughter? You've never met her. I said, I don't believe you. I said, Spirit's telling me something different. I said, you go and you check a couple things, call me back. She called back, and she was weeping. She said, you nailed it, man. I had no idea what was on that phone. God knows what's on our phones. God knows what's in our hearts. And we make choices. We make choices whether we're going to tithe and give our offerings. We make choices whether we're going to witness. We make choices about what church we're going to go to. And we make lots of important choices. We, we choose what college we're going to go to. We choose who we're going to marry someday. Lots of important choices. But I've got to tell you something. I close with this one. The most important choice is the one we make for the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. That's the most important choice. So as we start talking about requirements for salvation, it starts with a choice. You can either receive Jesus Christ and be saved, or you can reject Jesus and go to hell. Amen? So, well, I have a third choice. I'll just do nothing. I'll do neither one. Let me tell you, that's impossible because you've already done one of them. By, by ignoring and not paying attention to it, it's the same as rejecting. So I don't believe that. I thought you wouldn't, so I thought of a scripture for you. Anybody heard of the book of Hebrews? Still in the Bible? A preacher friend of mine got in trouble one time. He was a young preacher. He was on fire. We were in Arkansas, and I mean, he was full of the Lord. And he got up and he's talking about the Bible, this true story. He got, I mean, he got in a lot of trouble over this. This is, this is many years ago in Arkansas. And I forget what book it was. I think Leviticus or something. He said, anybody here read the Bible this week? Well, one or two. And he said, boy, that's pitiful. Everybody should have been reading the Bible. Man, he was just tearing them up. 
and he said, how many of you have been a Christian all these years? And he asked, that, that some of them raised their hand. He said, how many of you have read, I don't remember what book it was, probably Leviticus or something like that. And not one hand went up. And he literally did this. He grabbed his Bible, took the book of Leviticus, and just ripped it out of the Bible and says, well, apparently it's not important then. And it just horrified some of those old Baptists. He just destroyed the Bible in front of them. I mean, he got in trouble. I mean, I won't tell you. They didn't kill him, but they hung him out for several days in the sun and all kinds of things, all right? <clears throat> Tied him up on the ground where the ants could come and all that. And I've never seen anybody respect the written word as much as he does today over that. Amen? He learned a lesson. He's just all excited. But they were more interested in the fact that he ripped out the pages than, the, he had, than they had taken the word of God and put it in their hearts. You see the difference? Oh, we love the Bible. Do we love it enough to read it? Do we love it enough to read it? A choice. Now, a lot of choices after salvation. But the big one is choosing to be saved. Let's pray. Father, we love you this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Thank you, Lord, for Peter's words here that tell us, God, that you're not slow concerning your promises and reminding us, Lord, that you are not willing that any would perish, that any would go to hell, that, God, it is your perfect will that everyone and every person go to heaven when they die. Holy Spirit, I pray that you bring conviction to us today, those that are watching this message, some in the middle of the night, some watching it live now, those in the worship center this morning, that, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will take this message and use it, Lord, to speak to everyone's heart about their choice. With heads bowed and eyes closed, and all of you watching me on Facebook today, I ask you, have you made your choice? Now, some of you made that choice a long time ago, but you're not living for the Lord. You know what's so cool about our God? He's always ready to receive us, and we can turn it around anytime. Anytime we want to, we can turn it around. <clears throat> There's some of you that need to accept Christ as your Savior. There's some of you say, well, preacher, I made that choice a long time ago, but I've not been making good choices since. Turn it around today. Turn it around. You know, the devil's the one that says, hey, buddy, too late for you. Hey, girl, you messed up too many times. Don't you believe that lie? That's from Satan. Our God is ready to receive us at any time. And I believe today his hands are reaching out. If you're not saved, get saved this morning. If you're away from the Lord, come back home to him. If you're looking for a church where the Holy Spirit is and where God's people are coming together, you look for a church that has vision for the future and passion, we invite you to join us right here. Some of you ought to come and join this morning and move your membership here and plant your life. Say, I'm putting my name on the row, preacher. I'm proud of Summit Church, Texas, and I want to be a part of that church. And we invite you when we give the invitation to come and, and join the church if you've not done that. That'd be so awesome. That'd be so awesome. But if you're not sure you're saved, Pastor Bobby is here, Pastor Orman's here. We're going to stand here. And they can share with you what that choice means and how to nail it down. I mean, how to, how to put the nail in it and say, I know that I'm saved and I'm going to... I'm going to be saved throughout all eternity. You come this morning during the invitation. Maybe you just need to come get right with God. Say, preacher, I would never go home and tear my Bible. I would never tear a page in my Bible. I'd be afraid to do that. And I agree that would be wrong to do. But it's just as wrong to leave that Bible sitting on the counter and never read it. Oh, I, you know, I'm worried about that. Well, God is. God is. Maybe some people need to get right with the Lord this morning, folks. Maybe God's going to use you to get your family on fire. Whatever it is that God's speaking to you, we want you to obey him today.